It is great to see you here on this Easter Sunday. It's been a great day and it's a great day to have you here. Easter, here it is again. Some look at Easter and they think, all right, this is a great time to sell more Easter cards. Hallmark has to love Easter. Just because it's a great time for more Easter cards. Or maybe Brock's Candy. You know, they, they've got to love Easter also. Uh, just think of the candy sales and how that can boost uh, their sales for the year. You know, all the dressmakers. Everybody's got to have a new Easter dress, right? You know? And, and you look at Easter and what other people see when they see Easter. And sometimes you wonder, do they understand it all? Have, have they totally missed what it's all about? Easter is about, of course, as we know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But before we're too harsh on the people of the day that look at Easter and put other things to it, the Apostle Paul, even in his day, when he was writing his letters, came across the situation in the Corinth, the church at Corinth, and they had some questions about Easter. They had some questions about the whole resurrection. They had seen it for something else. And he spends quite a bit of time in 1 Corinthians 15 dealing with that issue. And today I'm I'm going to take an approach I've never taken on Easter. I want us to read through the largest segment of Scripture outside the Gospels. Resurrection and the topic of Easter. So we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul addresses some issues there. And I want to just kind of read through it. You can open your Bibles. I'm going to put the passages that I'm reading up on the screen. As we begin to see how Paul dealt with this. When he heard there were some that really didn't quite buy the whole resurrection thing. And, excuse me, they weren't quite sure exactly what it all meant. This is what Paul says. Now let me remind you. Dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before, you welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. Now, what is at stake here? What, what is the big deal? Paul says it there in verse 2. He says, look, it is the good news that, what? Saves you. It's about salvation. It's about where people will spend eternity. It, it, it is a big deal. And Paul, as he's wrapping up his letter to the Corinthians, he's addressed a lot of things. And it's almost as if he saved the best for last. He said, all right, if you didn't get all that other stuff in the 14 chapters before this, you've got to understand this. This is about salvation. This is about a message that can save you and give you eternal life. That's how important it was. And it's interesting there at the end of that verse that he says this, unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. Now, what other options are there? Well, in today's world, it seems like there's different options on every street corner. You can find a different belief here, a different belief there. You can get on the internet and Google something and find thousands of different options that are available out there. Well, they didn't have to deal with that in Paul's day, did they? Oh, yes, they did. You see, there were probably a lot of different options out there, and some of them you maybe heard of, some of them you didn't. You, you've probably heard, ever heard of Aristotle and Socrates, those two guys. All right? They were Greek philosophers. They lived about 300 years before Christ. And following them, and people would, would follow their teachings, and they would think that, you know, that is the answer to the meaning of life. If we can just absorb what these guys have said and, and get their philosophy. There are others out there that would say, no, 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 it's, it's the many gods. How many of you hated Greek mythology in school? Remember that? Man, I just hated that stuff. <clears throat> Learning all the Greek gods and where they were from and supposedly what they did. And, and then just once you get that figured out, they say, oh, by the way, there's Roman names for all these Greek gods. You need to know them too. I, oh, man, I, I hated that stuff. Well, back in those days, did you know that You would be called an atheist if you believed in just one God. 
you were considered an atheist. Why? Because it was a polytheistic culture. You had to believe in many gods in order to be a really religious person. The Apostle Paul, when he went to Athens, Greece, he was walking through the town there, and he goes out to the Parthenon where all the philosophers of the day would meet. And he stands up and says, Hey, I noticed you guys had a statue, and it was addressed to the unknown God. Why in the world would they do that? They created a statue in case they'd forgotten a god along the way. They just wanted to cover their bases. That's how much the polytheistic, the belief in many gods, was a part of that culture. So Paul knows that there's people out there that are following philosophies, the Greek gods. And then there was a blending of some people that would take a little bit of their own belief, their own philosophy, and they'd take a little bit of Christianity and they would blend it together. There was a group called Gnostics. And they really liked to uh, feel that they had the special knowledge from God. And they separated the spiritual aspect of man from the physical aspect of man. And they said, I can do whatever I want in my body because all that matters is what I have as a spiritual dwelling within me. It was called Gnosticism and it became a major threat to the church. The Apostle John addresses it in his gospel and in his letters there at the end of the New Testament. It was a powerful, powerful thing. So Paul reminds them, I preached you the gospel message. It's what you stand firm on. It is that which saves you unless, of course, you've chosen something else. Unless, of course, you think there's something else out there you want to believe. So what he's saying is simply this. Who will you follow? Will you be the one to follow even though we know that the message has not changed? Even though we know that the good news is still the same. And Paul basically says, what are you going to do? To remind them in the gospel, he goes on in verses 3 and following. Just in case they had forgotten what it was, he summarizes it really nice by saying this. I passed on to you what was most important and what has also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then the twelve, and after that, He was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Most of whom who are still alive. Though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Paul says, here it is. You want to narrow it all down. Here's the core of the matter. Here's what the gospel is. It's about the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God has raised him from the dead. And that message is what differentiated Christianity. Then it's still what differentiates Christianity from all the other religions of the world. There are other world religions out there. Hinduism, Confucianism, Islam. They all have a dead leader. You can still go and visit the graves of those leaders today. We have an empty tomb. And that's what makes the difference. It wasn't something that Paul made up. He reminds him this. He said, this is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it was confirmed by scriptures. And then it says, he, he uses that phrase twice. It was confirmed by the scriptures. It was confirmed by the prophecies. And then he says, and we also had some people see him. There were some eyewitnesses. There was Peter and James and the other apostles. And Paul includes himself and says, I was fortunate enough to be alive at the right time. Jesus even appeared to me. And we know from the book of Acts, it was that on the road to Damascus, Jesus came to him in a vision. But then he says, and then by the way, there's also 500 people that saw him at one time. And he said, You want to ask them? Some of them are still alive. Go look them up. It wasn't something that was just made up. It was true. And Paul reminds them. And he reminds us. And he challenges them. And he challenges us. Will you be the one.
to follow who he is. Well, they were still having issues. Not all of them bought it, and it's because some of the teachers among them. In verse 12 and following, Paul goes on to address this a little bit more specifically. He says, but tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless, and we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty in your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. How important is the resurrection? It's central. It is central to the faith. Next month, I'm going to start next Sunday. I'm going to be doing a sermon series through the book of Acts called the Acts of God. I'm going to spend eight weeks looking at the story of the church and how God worked in the lives of people then and how that impacts us now. And as you go through the, act, the book of Acts, you will see that the central message in every sermon that was preached in those days was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul's sermons were about the resurrection. Peter's sermons were about the resurrection. If you take the resurrection out of the faith, you have no faith. You have no belief. You see, there was a group of leaders. They were well known in the days of Jesus. They were called Sadducees. You've heard of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were the experts in the law. The Sadducees were basically the lawyers. They were the technical guys. Now, there was a major difference between what those two groups believed. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And that was something that was before Jesus even. They, they would say that there is no resurrection of the dead. Why in the world would you want to believe that? Well, that teaching seems to have carried over in the church. And Paul says there in verse 12, Why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, if you really believe that, then Christ could not have been raised either. And the issue was, there were some trying to say, I'm a Christian, I'm a following of Christ, I'm a follower of Christ, and yet, it doesn't matter to me whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. Even in today's liberal theology, there will people that will say, well, it doesn't really matter if Jesus rose from the dead or not. All that matters is if you, we gather his good moral teachings and we feel good about it, and, and that, that's all that really concerns us. Paul stands to disagree with them. The Word stands to disagree with them. And I don't know about you, but any time man says something and the Word disagrees with it, I'm going with the Word. That's a much better bet. It's almost if Paul is saying, okay, let's, let's play a little game here. Let's just imagine for a moment that you're right. Let's imagine for a moment that there is no resurrection of the dead. All right, let's just, just we'll, we'll, we'll give you that and let's, See just what all that does. What he does, he goes through a list and basically says, all right, if you're right and there is no resurrection of the dead, then, number one, Jesus couldn't have been risen. Number two, all this preaching is useless. Number three, your faith is useless. Number four, it means that we must have been lying about God. And that's never a good thing. It also means that you are still guilty in all of your sins. It also means that those who have died, because this is further enough in the, along in the church, that there would have been believers that had died in the faith, your parents, your grandparents, all those that died believing in Jesus, 
they're lost. And as if Paul's saying, other than that, it doesn't make any difference. Paul wants to make sure they know the truth. And in verse 20, he, he says this. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. There's a lot of implications about that. And he was challenging them and he's challenging us. Okay, there's the facts. Will you be the one to follow who he is? Paul goes on in verse 22. He says this. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam. That's a true statement, isn't it? Even though we hope we live a long time, there's not a one of us here. I don't want to depress you, but there's not a one of you here. They're not going to die. Unless Jesus would return before that happens. So Paul's just stating a fact, just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, and then he gives a contrast, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Paul says there's a plan here. And the plan here is this, when you follow Christ, when you believe in his resurrection, when you accept him as Lord and Savior, then you will receive new life in the resurrection. That's something to look forward to. Every now and then I have people who come up and ask me, they say, well, how do you like living in southwest Florida? And I say, well, you know what? There's a lot worse places to live in southwest Florida. It really is. Nice place to live. They even call it paradise down here. But you know what I found in paradise? Mosquitoes. No seams. Fire ants. Hate them. Alligators. Poisonous snakes. Bears running around neighborhoods. It's it's nice. But you know what? I, it doesn't hold us a candle to heaven. I, I bet you won't get up to heaven and look around and say, man, I wish I was back in southwest Florida. Yeah? <laughs> I really don't think you will. And Paul's saying, look, there's a lot of things out there. There's a lot of things people believe. But if you need to just evaluate what it is that really matters. And... In Christ, you will receive new life. Life forever. For eternity. Paul wraps it up with an amazing exhortation. And I, I'm just going to read it to not really add to it. Because it's the words speak for themselves and powerful. And I want you to listen to these words. And I want you to think and ask yourself the question. Will I be the one who's willing to follow? He says in verse 24, after that, after what? After the return of Jesus that he mentions in verse 23. He says, after that, the end will come. When he will return, when, when, he, when he will turn the kingdom of God over, or, I'm sorry, start over. After that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. He can say that because of the resurrection. And then he wraps up the chapter in verses 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up, in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. And then this is it, the crescendo. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray.